I do praise the Lord for Mr. Nick. He, he taught me last week very quickly how to do the taping and everything, and it worked, praise the Lord. And uh, so when it came to believing God for different things in this ministry, it's been exciting to see God move. Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, we only pray for ministry stuff. We only pray for, for the church to do this, this, and this. But every one of you and ourselves included, we all have different prayer requests. And there's not one too small or one too big that God doesn't hear. And I'll be honest with you, during, during the summertime, I love the summer, but a lot, there are different stresses as, as a person. I think Pastor Tim can relate to this. And one of the big stresses is the weather. And weather, and weather, no pun intended, whether, I said it again, we would, we would be able to get our hay in. And, and a praise report is we were able to get all of our hay in before the end of June, and that's almost a miracle in itself. And we had more than enough. More, than, I mean, a lot more, right, Tim? A lot more. And it was exciting when we started seeing, I mean, at first, when we looked at it, it's like, oh, it's really thin, it's this or that. And then we started raking it and started looking at it, and all of a sudden, I, went, I, keep, I watched Pastor Tim bale the hay, and wow, we got an awful lot of hay this year, and he bales some more. Wow, we still got a lot of hay this year. And pretty soon, it was just, it was more than enough, way more than enough. And see, God answers our prayers because he loves us. You know, when Pastor Tim mentioned the woman at the well and in his opening, and it talked, you know, I, I think about that. I think about Job, and I think about so many other uh, people in the Bible that talks about how God made promises. And the, like the woman at the well, she was a Samaritan. She was the mix between somebody from Samaria and, and a Jewish. And the, they, didn't, they didn't go together very well. But they believed in the promise. And she said, hey... You know, we worship on this mountain, but we're supposed to worship in Jerusalem. And just, you know, to paraphrase it, uh, Jesus said, hey, there'll be a time when you're going to worship in spirit and truth, and it won't matter where you worship. And he was making a promise, verifying a promise that has been in the Old Testament for so many centuries. And it was that blessed hope that one day we'll get to be with him. And we will be there forever and ever. So today... And if you've, you've been watching my posts, I really tried to push this so everybody would hear this, is, is uh, it's not empty promises that God gives us. And a lot of people, you, sometimes you feel like, God, why aren't you listening? And so th this is what I wrote this morning. What is an empty promise? <clears throat> and does God the Father ever give meaningless promises or empty promises? So here's the definition of an empty promise, a promise that is either not going to be carried out, worthless or meaningless. And why is it worse to make empty promises rather than not just saying anything at all? Doesn't empty promises mean at least the person has good intentions? How many people have told you, well, I I'm going to do that, and they don't show up, and they don't do it? And they'll say, well, I meant to, I had good intentions, but what does that do for you? How does that make you feel about their integrity? How does that make you feel about uh, who that person is and, and who, what will they do you know, in the future? Can I trust them in everything? Or do you slowly start to see the trust in that person wear away? So you could say a lot of times people will make a promise and I heard this so many years ago from a pastor on, uh, that I love watching on TV. And he, and he said, don't tell me I'll see you in church next Sunday, pastor, unless you're going to be there. Because most of the time we all expect, okay, we're going to be there. But there are times you don't know. And so, but he said there were, there were a few people that would say, I'll see you next Sunday. And they would never show up. And they had good intentions but guess what? They didn't show up. So what did that make that pastor feel? Like, and the person finally said it to him again. He looked at him and he said, you're a liar. Well, what do you mean I'm a liar? Oh my, well, you keep saying I'm going to do it and you don't do it. What does that make you? So it's better to say, I will try. 
if you mean it. If you mean it. And you can ask my children, over the years, they'll say, well, Dad, can we have this? Can we have that? I would say, I don't know. I'm not sure. And Josh, you can tell them later after the service, but Lord willing, I've kept most of my promises. Because I believe our children watch everything we do and say. And Peggy's famous words of, you know, what we do in moderation, our children will do in excess. And that means they'll do great things for God or they will lie, cheat, and steal if that's what we're into. Or if we're cursing and we're constantly negative, our children will be constantly negative and cursing. And you'll start to see a pattern. Making empty promises can be worse than not saying anything at all for all, for so many, so many reasons. For, for example, a loss of trust. When you make an empty promise and fail to follow through, it can damage your credibility and erode trust with the person you made the promise to. Trust is essential in any relationship, whether personal or professional, and breaking promises can lead to loss of trust that may, may be very difficult to ever repair. How many of us, when before we got married, we, you know, we were in different relationships, and the biggest thing that destroyed the relationship was the lack of trust? You know, what, you know what I'm saying? You, you just didn't know if you could trust that person. And I remember when Peggy and I were writing back and forth in our letters back and forth, I really had a problem with, um, I didn't know if I could trust her. I mean, how many guys would trust a girl that was on a campus that was filled with all, all, all these college guys? Well, then I look back, I'm thinking, well, how, does she, how do I know or how did she know she could trust me going to all these different ports in Spain and Italy and so on? Well, I knew I could trust me. And she knew she could trust herself. But you know, the, the devil will sit there and lie to you. And he'll, he'll throw little things in. Oh, I don't know if I can trust that person. Why? Because I have dealt with these things in my life over and over again. I heard somebody just say last Thursday, deja vu. And I like how he said this. He said, deja vu is your brain telling you that you have dealt with this so many times that as soon as you meet up with a certain type of person or certain situation, you immediately say, oh, I don't like that person, or oh, I've dealt with this before. And you immediately start to judge it when you shouldn't do that. And so when it comes to promises, it's the same way. A disappointment because of empty promises can raise false hopes and expectations in the other person. When these promises are not fulfilled, it can lead to disappointment and hurt feelings. This disappointment can be more damaging than not having any expectations in the first place. Now, there are times you have no control over the person that is, that is um, giving you the empty promise. You know, when we were, Peggy and I were trying to adopt uh, the different children in our life, I can't tell you how many times people say, oh, yes, you can do this, you can do that. And it was an empty promise. It was a lie. The person even knew that it wasn't going to happen that way. And so do you think I became very um, guarded? I guarantee I did. But I also became very forceful in what I believe God told me to say and do. Now, again, you have to make sure it's your father speaking to you when you speak forth specific things. And I told you the story about when Philip was, uh, when we were trying to adopt Philip and his uh, foster mom kept trying to, uh, to extend the, uh, the adoption process so that she could, quote, spend time with him. And, it wasn't, and that wasn't the motive of her heart. If that would have been the motive of her heart, we would have had no problem with it. <clears throat> the motive of her heart was money. And the motive of her heart was that she, she loved being a mom. And that, that was okay. But the problem was she didn't think about Philip's well-being. And I got to a point because he kept getting, every time we'd send him back with the foster mom in between visits, it, he would get worse. He'd get sick. And two or three times he almost died. So I got righteously angry, and I just said to this social worker, this has got to stop. It has to stop now. I want a meeting with all the people involved, and if we aren't satisfied with this, I want to talk to a judge. And she goes, oh, well, you don't have to go to that extreme. I said, no, his life is at stake. It's so important to us, and if you can't do that, then we're just going to call it off. And that was hard for us. And we had the meeting, and they all said, in two weeks, you'll have Philip full-time. And uh, we still had lots of struggles. 
He still almost died another two or three or four times. But you know what? We stood firm because we felt the Father telling us, He's your son. You will raise him and, and he will be a blessing unto others. And he always was, those of you that knew and loved Philip. Another thing about uh, empty promises is wasted time and resources. Empty promises can lead to wasted time, effort, and resources. If someone relies on your promise and plans around it, uh, and, and I love this, around it, only to find out later that it was empty, that they may have wasted valuable resources. And when they find out later, you never meant to even fulfill that. It will impact relationships, empty promises. Making empty promises constrain relationships and lead to resentment. People may feel misled or manipulated if they believe in promises that are not kept. This can damage relationships and make it harder to rebuild trust in the future. And, you know, I, I'm very aware of that as a pastor because often there's been times I've said something and it came out wrong and I found out later and I tried to make amends and sometimes it the people would forgive me and other times it wouldn't. And I understand how th somebody would misunderstand something that I would say. But I also understand that all of what we say and do in people's lives affect them and it affects us. The other thing is lack of integrity. And to me, this is very important. Making empty promises can reflect poorly on your integrity. It may suggest that you are not reliable or that you may not value your word. Integrity is, important, is an important trait that is essential for building a strong relationship and a positive repu reputation. And, you know, people say, well, I don't care what people think of me. Well, you should because you represent Jesus Christ. Whether you admit it or not, you're supposed to represent Christ. While it's true that making empty promises may stem from good intentions, it is important to consider the potential consequences of not following through on your promises. And so you kind of see about empty promise, but I'm going to tell you something. God the Father never made an empty promise. Even though there are times it feels like he's not fulfilling his promises, and we don't understand why, God is not human. He cannot lie. I mean, Christ was human, of course. Jesus never lied. And I, you always hear me quote, the Bible has 8,000 uh, Six, uh, 3, 8,367 promises. Well, I looked it up this morning. Somebody spent the time, so I have to change that. It's 8,810 promises. Somebody spent the time to figure it out, so I'm going to give them the credit, whoever it was, because I, I, I never went through and counted. I can't get past 1,000 before I fall asleep. I'm just saying. <clears throat> so God does not make empty promises. On the contrary, according to 2 Corinthians uh, 120. Have you, if you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians 120. Got a kick out of my, uh, my sister, and she lives near Portland, Oregon. Her son is a senior pastor at a church on the coast of Oregon. And um, she says, do you preach out of the, one of them iPads? I said, oh, I always wanted to get one so that I could just put it. And she goes, well, my son did that at first, and I didn't like it, and I told him. I said, you told him? She said, I like the sound of the ruffling pages. I said, okay, sister. I, and she's, don't take, and don't get a picture of this wrong. She's a lot like me in a woman's form. Okay, very forceful and, you know, verbal. Trying to make all my pots. She actually has long brown hair without a beard. At least I don't, I haven't seen her in a long time, so I'm not sure. Hmm, I have to ask her. Carol, do you have a beard? So uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 20. You know, it's, it, what's so cool about, you know, on a side note, talking about family, I've never really preached at her or through to her, but over the years, as I've talked to her, I realized that we still, we believe a lot of the same way. And she never went to a charismatic church or a Pentecostal church, but she really believes a lot like that. And it made me feel pretty good. Anyway. 2 Corinthians 1.20, in this, and I don't even know the version I have anymore. Let's see, it says, For all the promises of God in him are yes and amen to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and established the guarantee with the Spirit in our hearts. Now the version that I have over here is in, over in my, on my paper, 
The New King James says, For all the promises of God in him are yes and amen. <clears throat> to the glory of God through us. Now, a promise reveals a truth that will benefit us in particular. It declares God's will concerning the good with which he will bless us or the evil he will remove from us. The promises of God are a storehouse of blessings and a chest of goodwill bequeathed to us by our Heavenly Father. Those are the promises, and I stand on that. So why are the promises of God are yes and amen? Author Pamela Palmer wrote in March of 2023, she said, Scripture is full of promises from God who gives believers comfort, joy, and hope. So if you're not getting comfort, joy, and hope, you might not be listening to the right God. Many biblical heroes experience God's promises coming to fulfillment. Abraham, Esther, David, Jeremiah, and so many, so many, many more. So God's promises are still revel revelant for believers today. And that's, that's a big thing for me, trying to, to get everybody to understand. I still think about the promises a lot, a lot. And one promise that I tell my children all the time, and I believe that my children, because I love the Lord and I follow to the best that I can possibly through the Holy Spirit, I follow the Lord. And because of that, my children are blessed from generation to generation to generation, and that they have favor with God and favor with man. And because they love Jesus, they have favor with God and favor with man. And that's a promise I stand on. And I don't apologize for that. I speak the promises on my children. I will not speak the curses on my children. I will not. I will not speak poverty or anything else on my kids. When they might be having financial problems, I just speak favor and God's blessings on them. And that's what a father should be doing. I really, truly believe that my father didn't do that. And, you know, that's, I still love him, respect him. You know, he's, he's gone now. But I know, because I had an example in heaven, God the Father shows us through his word how we are supposed to bless our children. And I, I don't apologize for that. Perhaps in your, life, your own life, there have been moments where you have experienced God's promises coming full circle. In the New Testament, we read, we read of renewed assurance of God's faithfulness to keep his promises. Again, we talked about 2 Corinthians 1.20. And in that verse, it might sound a little bit confusing, because it used to, me, used to be confusing to me. So I'm going to break it down real quick. It conveys that Jesus Christ is the yes. Christ is the yes and the amen of all God's promises, meaning in Jesus, it's guaranteed in confirmation of God's promises. Jesus, because his birth, death, and resurrection, and his blood, guarantees and confirms the promises of God. And if you, if you believe enough to get saved, then if you have that kind of faith, then you've got to believe that Christ did all of the above. He did more than just die for our sins. He also died so that we would have an abundant life, that we would be healthy, and that so many other things would happen positively in our lives. <clears throat> Christians respond with an amen to the assurance of God's promise, which signifies our affirmation of, of and trust in God's faithfulness. And so, it, you know, a lot of people will say amen. And you know what? I, I have those moments. You know, you sit around the table, you pray with your children, let's pray for the food. But then there's always the Holy Spirit saying, okay, are we just doing this out of, because we have to. And I'll never forget, years and years ago, at, at the other ministry, there was a little boy named Will. And he was at what they called the Weeks dorm. And Pastor Tim was really good friends with uh, Mr. Weeks, who was a dorm father. And he was just a really, and, his, and the dorm mom was just a really neat lady. She reminded me a lot of my sister, Carol, kind of outgoing and stuff. And they were from New York, I believe, but um, they, one time they, made, they said they made a mistake to ask Will to pray. He was the youngest of the family. I don't know if you remember this, Tim, or not. But he, oh, man. You know, like 10 minutes later, he was done praying. Oh, God, we pray for, and he went to, down each person and prayed for each person and all, and people that I miss, Lord, and all, the food started getting cold. 
You know, but he really meant it. And you know, a positive note, he loves the Lord now. He's an adult. He has two babies, I think. Married a wonderful woman. He has a nice place that he lives in. He turned out okay. And he had a really, you can't imagine the rough life that he had. Uh, and it was, it was a real rough life. But he loves the Lord now. He, he writes his own music too. And, and he sings. And he's not afraid to share the gospel of Christ. So anyway, just a little positive note there. In his second letter, Paul's second letter to the, to the Corinthians, he was defending his change of plans. Now, when I say empty promises, there are times there's going to be a change of plans. But, but tell people why. You know, if you can't make it to an appointment, call them up if you can. As soon as you find out. And it's real, what's hard for me is when I miss an appointment because somebody else messed up. And as soon as I find out, I'll try to call and fix the best I can. But you, you need to know that Paul was trying to defend some of the decisions and plans that he made because he said integrity was so important. It says his integrity and honesty were questioned by some of the people at, at the Corinthian church. Paul acknowledged that our yes should be yes and our no should be no, but went on to write that it was also God who caused him to have the change of plans. Paul made the connection in the first chapter that just as Jesus is the yes and the amen to all God's promises, so he was also the yes to Paul having to change his specific itinerary. And the amen, the word itself is very powerful. It can, it can mean firm, faithful, confirmed, or, or of truth. Essentially, this verse declares boldly that God's promises are amen in Jesus, or God's promises are true and faithful and confirmed. So every time we say amen, we're saying, yes, we believe that. If you don't believe it, don't say amen. And you know what? And I, I'm not afraid to say in Jesus' name. Because if you just say amen, it's kind of like saying, well, I affirm that, I, I believe that. But I like to say in Jesus' name because then it's the name above all names. And I, I just love that part. Hmm. Though God's promises are yes and amen, we must receive it. And believe in that promise that, were, that was made for our benefit. And I, I, I found this really awesome, simple illustration I like to share. Author Howard Harden shared a, a very powerful illustration. Uh, the Toronto War Museum tells the story of, and I think I've shared this once, uh, once before, um, in the in Toronto War Museum tells the story of a 19th century man named Crowfoot. He was the chief of the Siska Indian tribe. He was known for his peaceful relationship with Canada during a great time of violence. When the Canadian Pacific Railroad was being built, they needed to build part of it on his land, and the Canadian government approached Crowfoot with an offer. They said, if you will give us this land that we need for the railroad, you can ride it whenever you and wherever you want. So they made the deal. They finished the Canadian Pacific Railroad, and Crowfoot received a lifetime pass. It was put in a beautiful case. Crowfoot is said to have carried the case around his neck for the rest of his life. It entitled him to go wherever he wanted where the railroad could take him. There was just one problem. As far as we know, Crowfoot never stepped foot on the train. He had the right to travel anywhere he wanted, but he never availed himself to that right. And when I found out that I had promises made specifically for me, it was like opening a whole bunch of birthday presents and believing that I was going to receive them. So how does that apply to you and I? There's a lot of Christians like Crowfoot that possesses God's promise. They quote them all the time. They frame them. They hang them on their walls. And they even post them on social media. But they never actually make use of them. Now, don't get me wrong. There are times we, we cry out for those promises. Charles Spurgeon once said, God never gives us a promise he does not intend for us to use. Did you hear that? So what should you do? Read them, get to know them, and then apply those promises which speak to your current condition, whatever that condition might be. Whoever gives heed to instruction prospers and is blessed. The one who trusts in the Lord, Proverbs 16, 20. 
Matthew 7.24 says, Matthew 7.24, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Do what? Put the words of God, put the words of Christ into practice. We have the faith to believe, if we have the faith to believe for our salvation, why don't we have the faith to believe for all the other promises? Romans 10, 9 to, a, 9 to verse 10. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And it just says it in verse 10. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. But guess what? It's with your mouth that you can be cursed and have a terrible life. And you know, it's interesting because with very, a few families, some of them that are in here, I've shared this before. I prayed that prayer specifically. I've got to go back there again. You declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. I believe when you declare with your mouth something and you believe with all your heart, it's going to happen. Uh, many of you remember uh, Maury Rosal and uh, his wife, Kimmy. They have um, a daughter. I don't remember her first name now. But she was having troubles having babies. A lot of trouble. How many do they have? Now? They're not babies anymore. Four, five? They have a bunch, and one just graduated from high school, I think, or, or something like that, I mean, or eighth grade, but it's just, she, they showed pictures on Facebook. I'm going, wow, this is really neat. I remember every time praying specifically for her to get pregnant, and people say, well, who are you? I said, because the parents, the grandparents said, could you pray for my daughter? I said, yes. But I believed with my mouth that she would get pregnant. Peggy and I would say, we're believing that she's going to have a baby. And we did the same for you guys back here, for Max and your little girl. I, I, honestly, because when I hear that, and you know, we prayed for you all too. Well, you, you've got four. <laughs> I never said it would be easy. Being a parent's not always the easiest. Whether you're adopting them or whether you're birthing them, it can still be a challenge. But I believe that when we pray and we believe it, we stick with that. And you know how many people I talk to when I do weddings and I do funerals, when I go to hospitals to pray? I tell them all the time, I'm not going to pray that you die. I'm going to pray that you live. If you die, that's, that's between you and God. I'm, I'm trying to stand on what the promise of God says. So when you're going through deep and painful situations, he gives us a great promise. He gives us all kinds of promises, but he gave us a great one through the prophet Isaiah. And I love this. When I first, when I was going through Bible school and I heard this, I'm going, oh, I love that one. It says in Isaiah 43, 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. I saw on Facebook yesterday or the day before that God gives you the umbrella to, cover, to protect you from the rain so that you can go through the storm and not get all wet. Well, I, I always stand on that. You know, God is going to protect us. Psalm 9, uh, verse 9, The Lord is my refuge for, for... It says, The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in the time of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. But do we, real, do we seek him at the last moment, or do we seek him all the time? See, that, that and, and don't get me wrong, I'm sure God reaches out to us in, at all times. But I, as a dad, I'll be honest with you, I like it when my kids come to me, not just when there's problems, but when good things are going on. I like to hear the good things. I really, really do. <laughs> I love that thing. That is so good. Nobody on, t on the video will understand what that means. Psalm 34, 17 says, The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. Let me ask you something. Who are the righteous? All of you, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Not your righteousness, but His. His blood made you righteous. And not self-righteous, Christ-righteous. Okay? Christ-righteous. You get that down, and it changes the whole perspective. 
When you begin to stand on the promises that, has given, that he has given you, you'll calm down, you'll be content in where you are and what's going on in your life. And you'll begin to nourish the deep prayer relationship that you've desired with the Lord. How many of you are still desiring a prayer relationship with the Lord? A really tight one. I still desire that. Okay, I, I just want you to know I desire that. And do I always... Do I always desire that in the morning when I first get up? No. I told you, I've got to have my coffee in the morning. You'd be proud of me. I used to drink like a half a cup to, no, a half a pot of coffee to a whole pot of coffee in the morning. I only drank two pot, or two pot, two cups. And they're big cups, but I only two cups. And um, by the time I've had the first one, I'm awake, I'm ready to go. And some of you, I'll even message you early in the morning, and I hope it doesn't wake you up. Hope you don't get a bing in the middle of the night. My sister used to, I would message her, and she goes, I really wish you wouldn't do that in the middle of the night because I keep my phone on. And I hear this bing, bing, and then she goes, I can't go back to sleep. But that's, that's when I'm awake, awake and I'm ready to go. <coughs> so, uh, honestly, it's just, you have to desire a special time with the Lord. Just like many of you, when you were looking for a very, a very tight relationship, when you are looking for a very tight relationship uh, that you can really, that you, somebody that you can love forever and ever and ever, and you really desired that. I mean, you've, you've been through hell, if you want to call it, with other relationships, so you really desired to have a decent one. All you thought about most of the time was to have that relationship. Well, you got that relationship, but how is your relationship with the Lord? Is it tight like that? And when you're missing people, when we sing that song, I can only imagine. It always brings back the memory of my sister's funeral that I, that I did. And uh, my, my nephew, who's a senior pastor now, singing that song. And everybody crying like babies because it meant so much. But that's also because we all knew we would see her again because we had a tight relationship with the Lord. God's Word is filled with promises from our Creator to provide and to deliver. I believe that with all my heart. The Bible is the ultimate source of truth and God is faithful to fulfill all of his promises. As you read the promises of God, claim them over your life. Freedom from addiction, deliverance from sin and evil, financial provision, hope for the lost and hurting family, friends and overcoming depression, recovering in marriages, good health, so on. So many other promises that are there for you. Find them. You can go to the Christian bookstore. They have lists of promises. You can go online and say, what are the list of the promises in the Bible? And, and you will find one that will apply to your situation. Stand on that. God's promise to provide for those who believe in him. Isaiah 26, again, verse 3. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Is your mind focused on the Lord or is your mind focused on something else? How many times has Pastor Tim and I told you it's best to pray for other people? If you have a prayer request, share that prayer request. But then also, so how can I pray for you? And you're going to find out something. The more you pray for other people, the less you're going to think about yourself. And the more you're going to focus on what God wants you to pray for other people. And before you know it, you'll be healed. Or you'll be delivered. Or you'll be set free from financial ruin and so on. Isaiah 41.10 so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God promised that through the prophet Isaiah. Deuteronomy 31.8 The Lord himself goes before you, and he'll be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. And, that's, <clears throat> and people will say, well, that's easy for you, Pastor Rob. Well, you know what is great is when you have backup. You know, Gary had shared when he was just, his, his body was tired, and, his, and he was tired of going through so much. But he had backup. He had his wife, his children, his um, son-in-law. He had all these people praying for him, and he had this church. And we didn't just pray some mamsy-pamsy little prayer. We, we prayed life into him. And if I ever need that kind of prayer, I pray you pray life into me. Don't pray death on me. Don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not ready to go until Jesus says I'm ready to go. 
when I hear that voice, come on up, son. I believe it'll be the last trumpet, but that's just what I'm believing for. Uh, Psalm 37, uh, 23 says, The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Do you delight in your God? Do you delight in your creator? Are you angry with him? If you are, go to him and ask him to show you why you shouldn't be angry with him. Ask him to show you the promises that apply to you. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Now this comes from a man who was about ready to be crucified. So take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest in your soul. Didn't necessarily mean in your body, but in your soul. Because it says you will go through persecutions. You will go through hard times in this life. But you, your soul will be, will be uh, content. Isaiah 40, 31, one of my favorites. You've heard me say it a thousand times. But those whose hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. What is it? Your hope in the Lord. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Isaiah 40, 29. Again, he gives strength to the weary and, do, and increases the power of the weak. Another translation. Then Isaiah 54, 7. No weapon formed. And Pastor Tim shared this in, um, in the, uh, the, the declaration. No weapon formed against you will prevail and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. And this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. That, that, that is a promise that God says for you. John 8, 36. So if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Philippians 4, 19. And my God will meet all of your needs according to his riches in glory. Psalm 27, 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? If he's your stronghold, you do not need to be afraid. So there are literally thousands of scripture promises in the Bible that can be applied to your life and to mine. Promise is only as good as the integrity of the person making that promise or the worth in terms of financial backing, if you want to call it, of a promise or the authority and the power to execute the fulfillment of the promise. God is, most, is the most reliable and trustworthy and powerful person in the universe, so we can confidently count on his promises. So, you know, you might not be able to count on mine all the time, you might not be able to count on your spouse, but you can always count on the Lord. Finally, you like that word finally, don't you? Because I don't know if you're as hot as I am with these lights on right now, I feel the sweat just... Whew. But as we grow in the knowledge of God and his promises in the word, we will receive a deeper faith, which will result in a life of trust and obedience. Faith doesn't come from information, but from deeply dwelling upon the word of God and, dwell, and letting the Holy Spirit show you what he wants to show you in his word. And this is what God wants for us. We bring him honor and glory when we fully live in his redemptive promises and as a result, fully live out divine destiny. When we know that he has already supplied for us, we become partakers of the precious promises. Peter wrote by his, and I love this, this specific scripture in Second Peter, Peter wrote by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We've received all this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself, by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruptions caused by human desires. So finally, I'd like you all to stand, if you can. If you can't, that's okay. And it's one of those declarations, I, I think I've shared it a couple times, but it's declaration to be a strong Christian. And this day and age, it's awful hard, isn't it? You know, just in the last few months, I've heard of three different pastors falling. Well, guess what? Pastors are human. You don't hear about all the non-pastors that are falling. But you know, God showed us years ago, keep your focus on Jesus Christ. Because we saw more leaders fall. We saw more people fall in different situations. We didn't focus on them. We focused on Jesus Christ. And that's what kept us in ministry for the last 40 years. 
So, repeat after me. I declare today, I will present my body to God as a living sacrifice, laying aside sin, bad habits, ungodly friends, and anything else that would hinder me in running the race that God has set before me. I will not conform to the patterns of this world, not its ways of thinking, talking or acting. I will spend time reading, meditating and acting on the Word of God. I declare that I will not think of myself more highly than I should. I will view myself honestly, knowing that any time I have or can do is only by the grace of God. I will not be jealous of giftings of others. I will, I will love others sincerely. I seek to love others in my thoughts, my speech, and actions, whether they are around or not. I don't gossip. I don't criticize or tear down. I am strong in the Lord and the power of His might. I will not lack in zeal for the things of God, but I will be passionate all the days of my life. I will be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. I will share with the Lord's people who are in need. I will bless those who persecute me. I will rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. This is a hard one now. It says, I will live in harmony with other Christians. I won't be snobby or conceited when I choose with whom to associate. Makes you think, doesn't it? Okay. I will not pay back evil for evil. I will overcome evil with good. As I walk and live in the perfect will of God, I fully expect see a powerful change in my life. In Jesus' name, Amen. So, Father, I thank you and I praise you for this moment in time that we can really look at your promises and that we will seek them out even more and will seek your heart's desire in our lives. I ask, Father, that you bless this moment in time that we're together, and I just thank you, Father, for the food and the fellowship that we'll have later, and I thank you for the blessing of being able to celebrate um, the Rugner's 45th anniversary and for all those who had the birthdays this month as somebody had a whole month full of birthdays. I ask that you bless them, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.